Yep. Uh, President uh, Samir, Secretary Nair. <laughs> yeah, Prashant. And then now we have a new adjective to all of you, for all of you, and that's the brave Rotarians, hands, and it's in guess for having come in this uh, lousy weather. So that shows how uh, keen we are to listen to him today. And hearty welcome to everybody, the senior citizen club members, the and other guests. It's not very often that we come across someone so young, so accomplished, and multi-talented as Hemushree. A student of artificial intelligence and machine learning at BNM Institute of Technology. Hemushree is not only good at academics, but also in Carnatic music, Bharatnatyam, and theater. While the list of her achievements is exhaustive, I think I'll elab elaborate on just a few of them relevant to today's talk. She demonstrated the use, usage and effectiveness of mirror therapy on amputees with phantom limb syndrome. I'm sure all of us are keen to know what all that is. She explored the use of music and dance therapy to cure mental illness might help some of us. She was part of the Stanford Neuroscience Summer Camp, where she presented a paper entitled Dialectic Behavioral Therapy in Borderline Personality Disorders. Last but not the least, she's also an Annette. Hearty welcome to her parents, Rotarian President Yogesh, and I'm Netravati, and to the brother. Dear Rotarians and Anne and guests, please welcome Hemashri Yogesh, who will talk to us today on neuroscience of music and dance. If we could turn off that light, I think that would be this light. Yeah, it's like directly on the presentation. Yeah, the floodlights. Yeah. Thank you. So before we dive into today's uh, topic, um, I would like, like to clarify one thing. Um, sir mentioned that I'm multi-talented. I would describe myself as multi-potentialite, which means capable of doing many things. Not that I'm excellent at everything, but I try to do my best. So that is one clarification that I wanted to do. Um, so diving into today's topic, which is the neuroscience of music and dance. Um, could we have the next slide, please? Yeah. So one thing I observed the minute I entered the hall is that 
this place feels like rotary i mean the minute you enter there are rotary there's rotary symbols everywhere and then i think it just helps us to get into the moment and we all feel like yes i'm a rotarian i'm a proud rotarian at that and i think this is a beautiful place to have all your meetings and i'm i'm very lucky i'm present here <laughs> to be talking to all of you yes so we got that slide so one question i would like to ask all of you before we get started is have you ever relied on music dance theater or fine arts or literature or even watching movies to get out of a bad mood so could we have a show of hands so how many of you try to interact with the fine arts on a regular basis yeah i think that was almost 70% of you so one thing with the fine arts is that all of us immediately connect to it and most of us have our special preferences but the human brain is designed to appreciate fine arts could we have the next set next slide please I've heard a saying that technology um, always fails when you most need it. So <laughs> let's hope it will. Yeah. Okay. So I'm pretty sure most of you have heard the Sutra Bhatam played at your house every day when you wake up. Um, we are familiar with Ravi Verma's paintings. We watch Pandit Birju Maharaj's performances, Dr. Rajkumar and Lata Mangeshkar. They're singing. And we all uh, dive into Rabindranath Tagore's uh, poets, poems. And I think we've all in somehow, some way or the other, we've grown up surrounded by the arts itself. So that kind of an all-round um, development that we get out of interacting with the arts is why neuroscience of music and dance is important for us. Next slide, please. So the agenda of today's presentation is, um, I'll give you a brief introduction to neuroscience. Um, I will talk about the effect of music and dance in the brain that is specific to each part. And um, we'll talk about the applications of neuroscience and music and dance. So where are we really using it in uh, day to day life? And we'll end it with a question answer session. Next slide, please. So, Hello. Um, neuroscience is the study of the nervous system, the brain, the spinal cord, and the entire nerves. Um, what we use neuroscience for is to find answers to various problems at the root level. So many people have uh, strokes. Those are not something that um, originate in the body itself. It originates in the brain. So many of the root problems can be tracked down to the brain and which is why neuroscience is important. Um, also, another application is to understand human behavior and to solve mental health issues. Um, when we say understand human behavior, we try to find out why a person is doing what he's doing and how can we help him to do it better. So that is the um, psychological part of neuroscience. And it includes different branches like behavioral neuroscience. So we're trying to understand the behavior of people. Cellular neuroscience, which is completely biological. We're trying to understand what each cell in the nervous system does. And cognitive neuroscience, which is about the thinking capacity of the person. Um, clinical neuroscience, which is the medicinal aspect of neuroscience. Computational neuroscience is the application of AI in neuroscience. And molecular and social neurosciences. And actually, there are so many other types of neuroscience. That is, cultural neuroscience. We try to figure out why a person behaves that way because of his cultural influence, and so on. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so the effect of music and dance on the brain, we always knew that music and dance impacted the brain in many positive ways. So most of you would have seen a mother singing a lullaby to her baby before it falls asleep. So we always knew that 
right from the very young age, people react positively to music and dance. But the reactions of the brain towards the fine arts hadn't been studied until the mid 1990s. And we found out that specific parts of our brain reacted more positively to music and dance. And practicing or listening to music or dancing leads to benefits like neuroplasticity and emotional regulation. So to understand what neuroplasticity is, um, do you know when the brain stops rearranging the neurons you know, to come to a formation, like a proper formation? Okay, um, at, by what age does the brain acquire a fixed structure? By the age of, I mean, you could give a guess, I guess. Okay. Yes. Okay. I mean, that is actually the correct answer. <laughs> So we are made to believe that after a certain age, you can't learn new things or you can't really understand. Um, we always, we hear the younger generation, I am myself of the younger generation, but we hear a lot of people say, Aji ning artha wala bodo, idu ning vaisaik ning artha wala anta. But that is um, something that is preconceived, but in reality, the brain never stops adjusting itself to new situations. So that is exactly what neuroplasticity is, the ability of the brain to rewire itself. When we talk about neurons, imagine it as a um, series of wires, like an electrical wires, which are connected to each other, interconnected to each other. So when I say rewire, it is taking the end point from one place and putting it into another place to um, change the structure of the brain. So while most of our body parts do stop going, the brain never stops rewiring. So that is one thing uh, that is very important that most of us have a misconception about. And the second thing is emotion regulation. How do you maintain a balance in your emotions? Maybe becoming too angry or too sad or too happy. How do you keep your uh, emotions at stability? So all these things are something, uh, all these things are the benefits of practicing or listening to music, dancing or watching dance being performed. Next slide, please. So this is something we call as an MRI scan. Um, the first picture is a brain at rest. You can see most of the colors are cool colors, that is blue and green, which means there isn't much of neural activity there. But in the second um, brain image, which is when there was music being played, you can see there is a lot of red, orange and yellow areas as well. That means there was an increased activity of the neurons. There was a chemical reaction taking place in your brain, which is why you were enjoying the music or understanding the lyrics of the music or just swaying your head to the beat of the music. So all that comes with the music itself. Next slide, please. Okay, now the similar study was done with the dancer's brain as well. So the first three, uh, A, B, and C, are the brains of dancers, um, which have an increased, they literally found out that certain parts of the brain were huger than the average size of um, the parts in other human beings. And non-learners had a relatively smaller size of those um, parts of the brain. Next slide, please. So when we say parts of the brain associated with music and dance, the first thing is the frontal lobe. Then we all start the day by saying, okay, I'm going to wake up at 7 a.m. or maybe 6 a.m. and I have to reach work by 9 a.m. and then I'll work for two hours, I need to take a coffee break and then I have to submit this and the list goes on. So all that planning, decision-making, and thinking is done at the frontal lobe. Same thing with music and dance. Every time I sit or anybody sits to sing music, we know. After this note, I have to hit this note. After this movement, I have to do this movement. So those things are being planned continuously while we are performing a piece of art. 
So that is when the frontal lobe has an increased amount of work and it helps to bubble up the frontal lobe. The next part is the temporal lobe, which is associated with auditory functions. So the ear is hearing the sounds and it is giving it to the auditory region to be processed to understand the audio. So the temporal lobe um, is always active, be it music or dance. We are always listening and reproducing the same sound. So that's why they say being a good listener makes you a good singer. And being a good listener also helps you be a better dancer. So the next part is the broker's area, which is associated with speech production and communication. There is nothing to say about this. The entire day you have to communicate with people. Man is a social animal and communication is entirely essential. So when we um, listen to music or sing music, the lyrics, we are constantly trying to understand it or produce it. So that is, in, that is where the regulation of the broker's areas take place. And the hippocampus is associated with producing and retrieving memory. Um, for a, music or a musician or a dancer or even a theater artist, it is very important to remember the sequence of events. So they need to know what happens exactly after what. Especially in um, Alzheimer's patients, um, they have lost their memory. And to bring back that memory, they try to stimulate the hippocampus. And most of the time, they do it with music. Because listening to a song that they've heard before in their childhood brings back memories like nothing else does. Next slide, please. So the amygdala is associated with processing and triggering emotions. Have you ever experienced the fact that when you hear some kind of music, you suddenly get goosebumps, there's a chill down your spine, or you get butterflies in your stomach. So those kinds of things are associated with the amygdala. It is also the part which helps you feel empathy. Um, empathy is something that uh, autistic children are less in. So when we try to help them through music or dance, they develop these emotions and that helps them to be empathetic to other people as well. The hypothalamus links the endocrine and the nervous systems. So the endocrine is in charge of keeping the entire body in balance. So that is also an additional benefit of music and dance. Um, the corpus callosum, like we already spoke about many parts of the brain right now. So in order for all these parts to constantly talk to each other, the corpus callosum acts as the mediator because they're located at different parts and the corpus callosum sort of links them all together and it helps the different hemispheres of the brain to communicate with each other. The putamen processes rhythm and regulates body movement. So you're just walking like this. I have a certain rhythm to my step. I'm not walking like... That is irregular rhythm. So when I walk this way, there's a certain rhythm to my steps. And that is something um, that people who have a brain injury lack. And to get back that sense of rhythm in your body, we need to stimulate the putamen, which can again be done by music and dance. Uh, because of the continuous beats, the percussion that is going on in music and dance, we will be able to stimulate the putamen. The vernix area is associated with comprehending written and spoken language. Most of the times, if there's a misunderstanding, the entire situation is in disarray. So understanding speech and analyzing speech is a very important function of the human brain. And that can be developed because we understand the lyrics before we sing. We understand the lyrics before we dance. So the vernix area is also regulated with music and dance. The occipital lobe is associated with visual functions and processing what we see. 
you would have seen music conductors and musicians themselves holding the script in their hand that has a different language that is it's called as a musical language there are different symbols which denote different um, time beats different notes so the minute they see they know what to sing the minute they see they know what to dance so the occipital lobe is continuously utilized while doing music and dance and we also utilize the occipital lobe continuously like right now i'm seeing all of you so that is the function of the occipital lobe and it is directly linked to music and dance the cerebellum coordinates movement and stores physical memory so let's say you've been driving the car for one year the minute somebody passes in the front you know you have to hit the brakes do you consciously think that you have to hit the brakes it just it's a natural response so the cerebellum has trained itself and it's become a muscle memory you don't even have to think about it your muscles automatically do it so that can be done because every time we sing our vocal cords have a certain vibration in them but the more we practice the same song the vocal cords get attuned to what kind of vibration has to be produced while doing what kind of note that's why they say practice makes perfect and then the last part is the nucleus accumbens which is called as the reward center of the brain and releases happy hormones like i said if you hear happy when you listen to a song or if you feel that you are um satisfied or contented after you listen to a song or watch a piece of dance then that is because there's the dopamine which is being released in your brain which is a happy hormone it just makes you happy next slide please so like i said researchers are continuously trying to find out the functions of the brain while listening to music or while watching dance so what exactly are the applications so the first thing is expressive arts therapy so when we say therapy the first thing that comes into our mind is a person sitting on a chair there's a table in between there's another person a psychologist sitting on the other side and they are telling their problems and they are giving solutions do you also get the same picture when i say, when I say therapy but expressive arts therapy is to make them listen to music or make them sing or to make them dance to help them ease out their movements that is what expressive arts therapy does it is used in the treatment of neurological diseases such as parkinson's disease schizophrenia alzheimer's etc so parkinson's disease is when um, like i said the pituitary loses its rhythm and uh, they have a certain stooping of the back and all that can be reversed if not cure the disease completely they can reduce the disease by using expressive arts therapy it breaks the art forms into components that can positively impact the uh, mental health disorders so like a, music is a vast subject dance is a vast subject we don't need everything for curing someone so the only things we will need are certain parts of music so if i need to cure someone um would say uh who have a um, Well, the hippocampus that is the memory um so if we want to jog back a memory we need to use a song that they previously have known so that doesn't mean we have to use every single song on the planet right so we only need to use specific songs which will be helping that individual so it breaks the art forms into components that can positively impact the respective mental health mental health disorder next slide please so most of you would be thinking okay uh, we are all uh, we don't have any mental health disorders we are all fit and fine so why do we have to know about the neuroscience of music and dance so actually even if you don't have a mental health disorder it helps you be a better decision maker like i said the frontal lobe is actively used and by training the frontal lobe into thinking and planning um in a very uh, suitable way um 
we are actually becoming better decision makers. Memory enhancement that is linked to the hippocampus increase their emotional quotient. And an emotional quotient is uh, if you would have heard about IQ, right? Intelligence quotient, how well you're logically able to respond to um, questions and scenarios. But emotional quotient is just as important, and I would say more important than intelligence quotient, because being social beings, we need to be there for each other. And understanding someone else's feelings and being empathetic towards them would really help us become a better society. So increasing emotional quotient is one of the main things that it would be helpful for all of us. Um, and the next one is prevention or delay of neurodegenerative disease. So most of you know that as we grow older, the cells are dying and they are worn out. And you can't do all the things that you used to do with the same energy. But by practicing music or dance, and or even theater and fine arts, we're actually helping the brain to keep itself in that stable stability mode where you can actually reverse the effects of the neurodegenerative diseases. Um, the, la um, the last two ones, that is improve social interaction and confidence and self-esteem. Um, you have seen most of the dancers or musicians, um, they're very sure of themselves. They're not very, um, they don't stand like this. They stand like this, they're confident. The shoulders are broad, their chin is up. So that's how they stand. The kind of confidence that they have and the surety that they have in themselves, that all comes because of the fine arts that they practice. And it improves social interaction, um, helps us to be better social beings. Um, next slide, please. Yes. So this was an overview of the neuroscience of music and dance. Um, I talked about a couple of the parts of the brain, but in reality, most parts of the brain are used. There are a lot more. The only ones I have talked about here are the main ones that is most impacted by music and dance. So I think now we can open up for questions. In one of your, I think, first few slides, you showed a brain at rest, and the one which has listened to certain music and you know, uh, dance and things like that, the one which is at rest, you said there's a lot of green and uh, such areas. Uh, I would have presumed that while listening to music or looking at any dance forms, your mind is at a more restful state than when you're doing nothing. But that seems to be full of uh, oranges and reds. Is there a bit of a, a contradiction there? Um, the regular state of the brain, when it is full of blues and greens, that is the resting of the brain, as in the neurons are not interacting with each other. So the neurons are chemically inert, they're not reacting with each other. There isn't any kind of messaging that is going on between the neurons. Like when, I, when, when we sleep, there is a, a regular state of the brain. Um, but when we're listening to music or watching a dance performance, um, all these parts of the brain are interacting with each other to create a more positive environment in the brain. So if this is the regular state of the brain, that's a more positive. And if it is more of blue and greens, it's a less positive environment in the brain. So rest in our terms is actually the state of bliss or the uh, place of contentment that we have. Thank you for the question. When we're thinking, it would be mostly the frontal lobe which is activated. So. When you're stressed, it is um, 
not the frontal lobe. The frontal lobe is only about the executive planning and thinking, and so on. Uh, when you're stressed, it is mostly about the amygdala, which recognizes the stress factors, and it also links to the endocrine system. So your heartbeat starts increasing, you start sweating a lot, and your pupils become dilated, and that is the fight or flight response that the brain gets. Yes. So my question was that since you spoke about music and its effect on the brain, so there's different genres of music. So how do those affect, you know, the different parts of the brain? Yes. Um, one thing that everybody should understand is each of our brains reacts differently to music. So what I feel when I listen to a particular song may not be the same thing that you feel when you listen to the same song. So that, that is also why different uh, people have different music tastes and different generations themselves have different music tastes. So um, when we talk about different genres, uh, it is found out that certain uh, types of heavy metal and pop music and rock music, the most affect the putamen, which is the rhythm, because um, you would have observed that there's a lot of percussion in those uh, um, types of genres. And when we talk about classical opera or uh, even Hindustani sound music, it's more of a, um, it's more of melody than the percussion itself. So that would mostly affect the other regions that is the amygdala for emotions and so on. Thanks for the question. Um, yeah, go ahead. Does music have a positive impact in early development of a child while still in the mother's womb? Um, studies have found out that it is positively impacting the brain, even inside the womb as well. Um, because all these things which are affecting the brain after we come out from the womb, it actually helps it to be formed in that way while the baby is in the womb itself. So they have found out that it is positively impacting the formation of the brain itself. Thank you. Uh, uh, I thought I should ask, how does uh, meditation and music or drama compare and the impact on the mind? Okay. Um, so one thing, most of the times in meditation, um, you use OM, right? And we don't say OM, we actually feel the vibrations when we're saying OM. And that itself is music. So anything that is pleasant to the ears is music, and anything which is harsh to the ears is noise. That is how it is categorized. But when we say OM, that is in meditation, or even while doing yoga, we are using all of the um, parts of the nerves, which are, uh, we, call, we call it a ganglion, which is a cluster of nerves located at different parts of our body. And meditation and yoga actually uh, induces those nerves to be at a higher chemically active state. And it will impact the brain positively. If anybody else has questions or if they have anything to share regarding to your experiences with music and dance or other fine arts, or if you would want to give me feedback on my presentation as well. Yes. I listen to a lot of Bhavad Gita, a lot of Bhavad Gita, Sugama Sangeeta. Yes. So I, I we also heard that you um, okay. Would, oh yeah. yeah, just one uh, small clarification. I believe color also impacts the brain and uh, subsequently your behavior. So do you have anything to share in terms of how the colors around you affect the brain? Yes. Um, so um, research has found out that different colors 
uh, activate different areas of your brain. So when we um, talk about blues, it, is, it has a more of a calming. Blues and greens are cool colors, which have a more calming effect on your brain. And reds and yellows are um, inducing your brain into go to a higher reactive state. So that's why most of the times in areas of learning, that is education or uh, office workspaces, um, cool colors and even white. Cool colors like white, green, and blue are employed. And most of the times, like fire trucks, danger symbols, and anything which is related to a higher activity, uh, higher activity of the brain is colored in the warmer colors, uh, like orange, yellow, and red. Um, so it does impact in different ways. So different colors have different meanings to the brain as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, music sets the mood, right? So how would music impact many minds together? Music impacting a single mind is fine. But then how does music or dance impact many minds together? Okay. Um, one thing that we see in concerts or uh, dance performances is that the artist is always placed at a um, stage which is very convenient for the audience to watch the artist perform. Even in music and in dance, we are actually relying on the capability of the artists themselves to deliver what they feel to us. So if the artist feels pain while enacting the scene, that is exactly what the audience feels as well. And this is a different branch of science called as noetic science, which shows that many minds interacting together can actually change the way the entire environment behaves. So that is called as noetic science. So that is why when people are singing bhajans, uh, there are like 100 people singing bhajans, it has a different aura altogether. And that is why they do things like satsang or so on. And uh, that is one thing. I'm glad you brought it out. Uh, many people together doing the same thing actually influences the environment. Depends on what they're doing, it may affect it positively or negatively as well. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, we are talking of listening to music, watching dance, etc. But sometimes you do that uh, subconscious. You know, like for example, driving, the music is playing in your car and you are driving. So you are actually not paying attention to the music, but you are listening to music. What difference is there on your brains between actively, consciously and subconsciously listening to music? Um, so when you are actively listening to music, one part of the brain that is more involved is the emotion part of the brain. So when I am listening to music and I start thinking, okay, this kind of, a, this part of the lyrics has happened to me as well, or this mood of the song, I felt it before, those kinds of things that you can only feel when you're actively listening to music. Say when you're at a um, mela or something and there's just music blaring over the speakers, you don't really connect to that music. That connection is lacking because your emotion is not linked to that music. So the main area which would be affected is the emotional regulation, that is the amygdala would be affected. Better, much better. <laughs> Um, what kind of a genre would you guys prefer? One Bhavagita, please. Okay. Yeah, that's my favorite. Mm -hmm. 
Um, this is a song which was originally written in Bengali by Rabindranath Tagore and it's been translated to Kannada. <laughs> to give us a word of thanks. Good evening, President Samir, Secretary Prashant, and, and may I call you Hema. What a spectacular evening we had this. I mean, we are in the business of manufacturing uh, MRIs. And of course, I've seen all this uh, cognitive images. <clears throat> we've done a lot of, although I'm not a <clears throat> uh, biologist, I'm not a doctor, but I was a biologist and learned a lot of uh, neuroscience and, and <clears throat> You've been able to explain this. Hema has been able to explain this very lucidly to a common man, who and we could understand all this so very easily. And I was just going back and realizing twenty years ago, I was sitting in a G office in Milwaukee trying to read books, understanding all this which she told us in twenty minutes. Amazing, simply amazing. <laughs> Last year, I was doing a project with Spandana. <laughs> I did not know if I had only seen the sequence of uh, the music running, Mere Sapno Ki Rani Kab I went to done a dialysis project with Spandana. We put up two dialysis machines in uh, Shivakshetra Hospital 
with President Kale Goda and uh, Ravi Chandran, uh, the previous past president, and uh, Srinivas. Fruit Alice submissions were given, and that's functioning very well. If I had known that, that you had a daughter of this, they would have possibly looked at putting up an MR there. Yeah, <laughs> I'm sure, I'm sure, I'm sure. MR therapy is the new MR which is coming in, where uh, normally no implants are allowed and all that. The new type of MR which are coming in, you can go and do a surgery or you can sing music and see images at the time of uh, shooting a picture or uh, doing a scan, that's what we call it. So maybe you can do that. But short of going through this entire uh, you know, class on anatomy in 20 minutes, uh, my cognitive senses have really got excited and, uh, uh, and in MR physics we call signal to noise ratio. If the signal to noise ratio is very high, you get artifacts. So, so this is a perfect image of a, a wonderful evening in Rotary Cantonment. And I think we should make sure that all our other Rotary clubs in the district also get this flavor of what we can do uh, to help degenerate the diseases, neuroscience diseases like Alzheimer's, uh, dementia. Sad we can do that. ADRAG, we have a chapter called ADRAG. We can do that. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. I think I should thank Saurabh Kubo for calling me the last word and asking me to propose his word of thanks. Thank you so much. I wish you all the best for the wonderful talks in the future. Thank you so much.